Pyro Debrief. Coming up. Hey 7-4 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel, 7-4 Gear, is all about aviation. As always, I want to tell all of you and the 7-4 crew how much I appreciate you sending me videos to keep this series going. If you have a video that you want to see in the series, the two places to send it to me, my Instagram or the free forum, 74gear.com. All right, let's get into it. This is a 747, obviously, and it's obviously missing some of the landing gear. I haven't done a lot of research to see exactly what happened. The cursory overlook that I looked at said they had some issues with their hydraulics and they decided not to cross the ocean, and so they decided to come back in and land. I'm guessing these pilots had to dump fuel before they came back in and landed. Usually a plane that's going to go across the ocean is going to be over the maximum landing weight. A plane is given a weight for takeoff and a weight for landing, and the landing weight is always less than the weight for takeoff. So these guys probably had to dump fuel before they came back in and landed. Now, I have dumped fuel on the 747, which was crazy. It was not crazy like, oh my gosh, this is so scary, but crazy like, I can't believe I'm doing this. And we had to dump a lot of fuel. We were going to go across the ocean. We had a problem with one of the flaps. It wasn't retracting all the way. We weren't sure we were gonna be able to make it across the ocean and the route that we had didn't leave us any backup plan. If it didn't work out, we were worried about the extra drag. So we dumped a bunch of fuel. Our issue was obviously a lot less of an issue than their issue. If we have our flaps, you know, coming out slowly or some are coming out and some aren't, that's not a huge problem compared to missing landing gear. But there is something that's kind of interesting here and it shows the difference between flying passengers and flying cargo. When you fly freight, you can put a lot of weight on the aircraft and go a short distance. When you're flying passengers, you can only put so many people on the main deck and the upper deck of the plane. So there's only so much weight, even if you put stuff into the belly, there's usually only so much weight that that plane is going to land at. I've not done enough long haul packs flying to say typically what their landing weights are, but I'm guessing they're typically not landing at max weight. But if you're dumping fuel and coming back to land, you probably are gonna be somewhere near max weight because the airline's not gonna want you to just dump a bunch of fuel if you don't need to do it. So they're usually gonna say, dump fuel to your landing weight and then come in and land. For those of you that are scared about flying, I just wanna tell you, this is super abnormal. There is a bunch of redundancies in place to prevent a situation like a landing gear coming down or not coming down in this case. And I'll talk about it a little bit later in the video, but I just want you to know this is very, very rare. It's very rare that you ever dump fuel. When I dump fuel, I talked to some guys. I was like, dude, I got to dump fuel. I was kind of excited just because it's so rare that there's any type of an issue that would require you to do that type of landing. It wasn't an emergency. It wasn't any type of abnormality. We never squawked anything or did anything crazy. It was just hey, we're gonna have to dump fuel to come back in and land. Now we could have just circled around and just flew for like five or six hours, but we decided to be safer just to dump fuel, get the flaps out and come in and land. Take a look at this video though. See how hard the pilot hit and how hard they bounced up in the air? That wasn't necessary, but there are some factors here that probably you wouldn't consider. A flight that you have seen me do recently because I've been doing Miami flying, I've been doing a lot of South America. Sometimes what happens when you do a short flight like that is you'll take off in Miami with a lot of weight and you'll fly a short distance and land at maximum landing weight because you only need a little bit of fuel to get on, let's say, a three hour flight. A great example of that would be on something like Miami to Bogota or to Quito. It's a three or four hour flight. So we'll take a lot of payload. We'll be at the maximum weight that we can realistically take off with based on how much we can weigh when we land meaning we have to take off factoring in how much we're gonna weigh once we get to our destination. 
When you're doing passenger flying, you're usually not going to do a three hour flight like that. That's going to be fully loaded and landing at the maximum weight because you're not going to have, again, in the main deck or the upper deck where we normally can put tons of extra cargo and stack it to the ceiling. You're not going to be able to do that with people. So the weights are going to be very different. What that means is as a freighter pilot, you're going to be more likely to be landing at your max weight. You possibly are going to have a higher approach speed as you're coming in to land. For example, just the other day we were coming in and it was windy, so we had to kind of change the speeds that we were coming in to land, but I think we were coming in around 170 or 175 knots to come in and land. We were very heavy and it was very windy. So in a case like that, that's not something you will typically see when you're flying passengers because we were heavy and it was windy, so our approach speed was very fast. What I noticed when I watched this the first time is the sink rate. That's the speed that the plane is actually going down vertically. It appeared to be quicker than normal, but it's very hard to see and be sure just how fast it was actually going just because the angle of the camera. But what I did notice and watch this again is the pilot flared almost at touchdown. Look, you'll notice as the flare is happening right at touchdown, in that case, the pilots are actually driving the landing gear into the ground even harder than just being a heavy plane and that bounces them up in the air. It's a little bit different than that Silkway one that I showed you, obviously not near as hard as that, but still pretty firm. And this is what I think happened. I think more likely than not, they were on a faster approach speed than they normally would land at. And you can sometimes get rattled when you're outside of the norm. When we were dumping fuel and as we were getting ready and everything configured to come in and land, the captain said, this is no different than any other normal max weight landing that we always do the exact same. And I thought that was really interesting because in my head I was thinking, okay, this is going to be different and it's going to be this, but in reality, it was no different. And I thought, hmm, that's a really good point. This is a little bit of a different situation because these pilots that are flying passengers are typically not going to be used to landing at the max weight. Plus, they have a landing gear missing. So that puts you a little bit out of your rhythm. You're a little bit scared or nervous or concerned or you're thinking about it. It's different than what you're used to seeing on approach speeds. And so it can create a different feeling because the reality is you still have a lot of your landing gear, but you're missing one. What's going to happen? Honestly, when I saw this, I thought, hmm, is the plane going to tip over? I don't know. Now that I know, it's going to make me feel a little bit easier if this ever happens, which I hope it doesn't. I actually took a photo. And this is off my Instagram. I took a photo standing next to that actual landing gear, not on that plane, but on a 747. I took a photo there standing next to it and it is a big landing gear. I'm six feet tall and you can kind of see just the size of it. So it gives you some perspective of just how big that landing gear is. And obviously it's necessary, but they were able to land with one landing gear, one full set of landing gear missing, land stop in the middle of the runway. And like I always say, at the end of the day, granted it was a hard landing and they bounced, but at the end of the day, the plane stopped middle of the runway and everybody was okay. So what actually caused the incident, it was the mechanics had installed something upside down. And since that point, like everything in aviation, there has to be a problem like this, then they come up with a new solution. So they changed some things and markings to prevent that from ever happening again. But when the first officer did the walk around, he wouldn't have noticed that there would have been any problem because whether it's upside down or right side up, the thing that was installed incorrectly looks basically the same either way. So they didn't notice until he got up in the air that it was a problem. It just goes to show you how redundant these planes are and how even with missing landing gear that it can land, it's really impressive. Jump out. It's hot. Just wait. Yeah. Well, hold on. Stay where you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wait, wait till stuff gets switched moving. You yep. good? I'm good. Okay. Y'all good? Yes, yep. sir. I'm good. Perfect. Sorry about that, boys. No worries. That's all right. It's all right. What you witnessed there was an excellently executed crash landing in a helicopter. Now, when I went through flight school, I was lucky enough to live with two helicopter pilots. My training partner on the 747 was an ex-Army helicopter pilot. 
So I've spent a lot of time around helicopter people, so I've learned a thing or two. And what happened here was amazing. When you have an engine failure in an airplane, a regular fixed wing airplane, you have a lot of time to think. There's this old saying is that when your engine fails, you need to wind your watch. And this was from an old World War I fighter pilot. And it's basically like, you have some time, don't be rash, making quick decisions because that's how you can make a mistake. In helicopters, it's really not that way. If you lose your engine, you need to react really quickly. Obviously, you know that on a fixed wing plane, your regular airplane, those wings are keeping you flying. On a helicopter, the things that keep you flying is that rotor blade. That rotor blade that's above your head, that is acting like the wings that are on the side of your plane. So if that stops moving, it's like if you took your wings off from your plane. As you watch this again, it took about five seconds for the engine to fail, the pilot to recognize what the situation is, choose a landing spot, head over there, and get in and land. Now five seconds happens really fast when your life and the people that are on your helicopter's lives, lives are on the line. That was very quick thinking to identify the problem, come up with an idea, execute it, and do a really good job getting everybody on the ground quickly and safely. You'll see here as the engine failed, he looked for a landing spot, he pushed the nose over to keep the speed up, and that's something that you have to do in this type of a situation, it's called an auto rotation. So he pushed the nose over to keep the speed up, then he heads for the trees, and then he hits the trees as he's coming down, which actually maybe helped break his fall a little bit, but they got on the ground safely. And then he's relaxed, as you can see, he's smiling, and he did a great job getting everybody on the ground safely. Either way, I'm gonna stick to my fixed wings because I'm not smart enough to analyze and make a decision as quickly as that guy did. He did a great job, and hopefully the other people that were on that bird with him bought him some beers that night because he totally deserved it. All right, that is a 777, a 777. And for those of you who are new to this channel and new to planes, this is one of the easiest planes to identify. See here how it has a row of three tires, and then at the end of the wing it's straight, there's nothing out there, that's a 777. All right, so let's talk about this gem of a landing from these pilots. Now there are a few situations that can cause this. One would be wind shear. Wind shear is something that's hard to determine because it's wind and you can't really see it but I don't think that's the case in this particular situation. You'll notice here the windsock has no wind in it, so that makes it hard to have wind shear if you don't have wind blowing at all. When you have a larger jet, it's really, really important that you keep your wings level once you land. It's something you don't need to do in smaller jets. I created a really bad habit of always landing with some correction in, meaning one wing was lower than the other when I was coming in to land at a strong crosswind. It's a habit I picked up in flight school, kind of how the way I was taught, but when you get to big jets, it doesn't work. So then I had to change everything the way I was doing it. As he comes in to land, he decides to make a correction to bank to the right about 10 feet off the ground, which is way too late in a plane of this size to be making that type of a correction. At this point in the landing, if you were so far off the center line that you'd need to make that aggressive of a bank to stay down the middle of the runway, you're better just to go around because it's too low to the ground. You could easily hit your wing or your engine or do this, and none of those things are good. As he makes a correction, he banks hard to the right, slamming the right gear down into the ground. What happens? It creates the seesaw effect, and you'll see that the other side then slams the ground as well. And now it's just going to teeter back and forth because you have all this momentum going left and right as it goes down the runway. Eventually, it stops, but that was not comfortable for anybody on the plane, especially the pilots. That would be very embarrassing. It really just comes down to momentum. Once that momentum started, it's just gonna go left and right until the plane rolled out and slowed down and the momentum went away. The right choice in this situation, obviously, if you're that far off that you need to make that aggressive of a correction, would it be to do a go around, come back in and try it again. You don't wanna be making corrections that low to the ground. I've told you before that I tried to make a correction in a really stiff crosswind when I was a new pilot on 7.4, and I think I got about five degrees of bank, and the captain's like, wings level, wings level, and that was five degrees. That was well over five degrees, what I think those guys did there, and that was a lot more aggressive than what I was trying to do. They should have just done a go around and tried it again. Nice.
That is a great example of a crosswind landing in a large jet, and this is really windy. You see here at about 50 feet, the pilot has the wings level, but they're still in the crab. If you aren't familiar with the term crab, it basically means the plane is at an angle coming down the runway. It's tracking down the middle of the runway, but it's doing it from the side, kind of like a crab walks across the ground. Now, my personal strategy that I've developed based off of flying and a lot of coaching that I've had is that at 30 feet, I do the flare just like normal. I pull the flare back, a little bit, a little pressure off, and then I wait for the 10 countdown because we have a countdown from 50 through 10. At 10 feet, I just start adding rudder pressure in until we're lined up down the runway. You don't have to do that. You can land in the crab. I just don't like it because if I'm flying passengers and you got someone way in the back, then it's gonna slap them around. The plane can do it. It's built to do it. It's not a problem. If you feel that's safer for you, then do it that way. For me personally, what I like to do is at 10 feet, I just take the crab out by adding some rudder pressure until we're going straight down the runway. And then usually it's pretty smooth from there. Watch what the pilot does here. About 50 feet, 30 feet, 10 feet, and then they roll out. What is hard to see just because of the way this is filmed, which I don't know how you get that close to the runway to film that, but cool. Anyways, what's hard to see is the ailerons turned into the wind. I'm guessing based off how well executed that landing was, they got the ailerons into the wind. Something that's interesting on the 7-4, because our wings are so big, that wing that is upwind is gonna catch a lot more air than the wing that's on the other side that's not getting a lot of wind. So you'll see sometimes is that they'll land and then one wing will start to lift up. It's lifting up for two reasons. One, when you rotated the plane, you sped that wing up. It started going faster because you brought it around and straightened it out on the runway. That's the first thing. And the second thing is you got air blowing underneath it. So you'll see one wing go up. Something that, again, I developed a bad habit on was that when we would land, I would let the ailerons be neutral. I'd let the yoke be neutral. You cannot do that on a larger aircraft like that because it will actually lift up, which can result in you slamming your engines on the other side down. So you can make a smooth landing and then slap your wing on the other side of the ground. It's embarrassing. These altitudes that I'm talking about, 50 feet, 10 feet, those apply to big jets. It's not gonna work on a small plane. If you flare at 30 feet and you try to get the rudder level and straightened out on the runway at 10 feet, you're gonna be way too high. I don't know what it is on a small plane. I just know it from looking. Maybe it's like two or three feet. That's plenty of time. So it's a cool habit when you're flying to try to work on that skill. If you can master that skill on a small plane, you have a lot more room for air. We have another advantage on these larger aircraft is that we have a countdown. Like I said, it goes from 50 through 10. So I use that kind of as my cheat code. 50, when you hear that 50 foot call out, I go, okay, think about the flare, 30 feet, Time to flare and let off the pressure. And then at 10 feet, let's straighten her out and get her down the middle of the runway. That's the countdown that I use for myself. So I've joked, and a lot of pilots have joked about this, without that countdown, it's kind of our mental cue. So without that, it makes it very tricky because now you're relying only on what you're seeing outside the plane and not hearing that countdown. That countdown we use a lot. Do we need more power? Do we have too much power in? We use that. There's a cadence that we want to hear. And if it's not sounding like it's supposed to, we know we need to make a correction. So we have another cheat that way that you don't have in a smaller aircraft. If you do everything perfectly right, what will happen is you'll get your main gear on the ground and then you'll hear this whining noise, which is like And what that is, is your speed brakes. On the plane outside, you see these go up. The pilots don't actually do anything. We arm a lever for that. So when the wheels, the main wheels touch down, that speed brake makes a noise and it comes back. And if you do everything right, you don't feel the plane get down and you just hear that speed brake come back. And it is such a sweet feeling. Then you throw the reversers in and you roll it out. Then you talk some trash and then you hope that no one else from that crew ever sees you do another landing because then they're expecting you to have the exact same landing because you just talked all this trash all the way down the runway. Here we are landing in Barakai. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on our final approach. Please make sure that your seatbelt security pass and thank you. It's been a day now. Five 
hundred. Nice landing. <laughs> okay, here we are in Barakai. <laughs> bye bye. Now I don't know if this is the real audio or not, but the guy that's making the video is saying that they're going into Boracay, which is in the Philippines. The Philippines, if you've never been there, have some beautiful, beautiful islands, and this is one of them. It's a really short runway, though, so there's a few things that are happening that make me wonder if this is the real audio or not, because you have the pilot making a landing announcement very close to the ground, and then you have the flight attendant also making an announcement very close to the ground. So that's not what you normally want. I'm not 100% sure here, but take a look at the flaps at the start of the video. It looks like the flaps aren't all the way out and they're under a thousand feet. So under a thousand feet, the flaps probably aren't out and they're making an announcement and they're landing on a super short runway. The runway in Boracay is very, very short. So it doesn't really matter if you land towards the end of the runway, the runway can be three miles long. If you land towards the end of the runway, it's never gonna work out for you. You see them come over the runway here and they just keep floating. That's what happens when you don't properly manage your speed and you get behind the plane and do things like put the flaps out really late. When I was in flight school, I had this problem. I would always carry too much speed coming into landing. I don't know why I thought the plane was just gonna fall out of the sky if we went like one knot below the suggested speed to come in and land at. So I would just keep way too much speed in, which would cause me to float. And that's where I started saying, welcome to Float City, because that was a bad habit that I picked up and I worked really hard to get better at my speed and energy management. As they touched down, and it seemed really firm actually, you'll notice how far they floated. Now, if you float down the runway, you wanna at least have a very smooth landing. You'll notice the speed brakes go up and that pushes the plane into the ground and it makes the brakes more effective. Now let's count these white bars. They're 500 feet apart. So you see this one here, this is the second one indicating they're a thousand feet from the end of the runway. Normally that's where you'd land going the other direction. Then you have the 500 foot one here and they're still going really fast. I'm not hearing people jolting around or seeing something to indicate that they're really stomping on the brakes, so I'm not really sure why they're not. But this is a really easy way to get a free, all expenses paid trip to headquarters and meet the chief pilot. And of course, get you on viral debrief. If you wanna see some of my flying and you can correct all my mistakes and goofs, check out this video here. And if you wanna see an A380 have a crosswind landing that does not go very well, check out that video up there. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.